In this episode of Investing in Real Life, I'm going to give you another portfolio update for my options journey. I'm going to discuss more so why I made the transition over. And of course, I'm going to discuss why I think Kevin Hart is rich and not wealthy. Let's start the show. What is up, everybody? How's it going on another Sunday evening? This is Sophisticated Investing Life, and this is Investing in Real Life Episode 2. All right, let's touch on what we will be discussing today. We're, of course, I'm going to start off looking at my options trading portfolio. You know, two weeks in, how are things looking? What am I looking for next? Um, we're also going to touch a little bit just quickly on why I prefer option selling. I actually made a video, a recent video. You can check it out in the card. Just, you know, just a basic explanation of what options are. And towards the end, I talk about why I like selling options versus buying them. Um, so just going to give more color there. Um, touch on some market news. Going to shout out another finance YouTuber. And then we're going to come here and go to our feature. Why Kevin Hart is rich, but not wealthy. So let's get started. All right. So first things first, we're going to look at my trading account. Um, as you can see, only up modestly in one week. Not that much, right? Not that much at all. And for the most part, it's due to me not really closing out any trades. A lot of the trades that I had open before um, this week, well, this past week are still open. I ended up only closing one trade and that was an Apple trade. Uh, which did pretty well. I got in numbers. It was only like twenty five dollars, uh, but there's a lot more to that. So uh, I can talk more about my my strategy later on. You'll learn more as we go. But overall, I still have three trades. Well, now four, three trades open. Um, two are connected to Broadcom, right? And with Broadcom in particular, you know, I'm just hoping for the best, right? That's all. That's all I can really say. I'm hoping for the best. Let me look them up right now um with broadcom they're still in between the ranges i need them to be in in between so that is specifically i want to say between 280 and 340. so if we look at yes 340 call and i sold a 280 put so yes they are still in the ranges i need them to be well yes they're still in the range i need them to be in and actually the 280 number might actually turn positive soon uh, well, it's already turning positive, but it might become even more positive. Same thing with um, the call, right? So if you all remember from last week, I was in some trouble. I was in some trouble big time with both of these positions, right? I was in trouble big time. But now it's starting to look like they may become positive. So I might be closing out of these trades fairly soon. Also, um, I put on... Well, I also might be closing out Boeing very true soon, but I also made a mistake. I put on the Alibaba trade, right? So Alibaba seemed like a pretty good idea. Um, it's an idea that um, has plenty of liquidity. It's one of those stocks that I love tracking and love um, doing trades in because it's high liquidity and you receive a lot of premium up front for trading a stock like Alibaba because of, it just naturally has a higher volatility. The issue is um, earnings announcements. Earnings announcements, they are a bugaboo. Right, they are definitely a bugaboo because option pricing acts weird. They tend to act a little weird around um, earnings announcements. Um, speaking of options pricing, I definitely have a video coming up in the next coming days, probably towards the end of this week, touching more on that. But this is the big issue here. The big issue is right here, next earnings day. All right, it is January 29th. So coming up maybe the next 10 days, right? That's not good because I don't, I don't want to play the earnings game. That's not what I'm into. There's a strategy designed to play the earnings game, but it's not mine. So I usually try to avoid stocks that have earnings coming up relatively soon, maybe within the two to three weeks, which I'm putting on the trade, right? So with Alibaba in particular, as soon, and I mean as soon as this and it's already starting to turn a little positive if you look here, right? So I received $6 and net zero right here. So if this holds up when the market opens on Tuesday, 
best believe I'm closing out this position because it was a mistake. I shouldn't have opened it in the first place, right? So close out, get out of it, and move forward, right? So that's the idea. And even though I had a slow week um, this past week, something tells me this next week is going to be pretty active. Now, what am I looking forward to? First, as you all probably already saw, NVIDIA. NVIDIA is one of my favorite stocks of all time. If you were keeping up with me when I was doing stock videos, like pitching stocks, I did three, maybe three videos just on NVIDIA. I love the company. I love what it stands for. I love what it's doing, right? And now I, f I found out last year, I also love the options too. It's another one of these stocks, very volatile, very volatile, um, gets a lot of attention, but hey, it, it's all, it all works out. It's all pretty good and you get paid for that attention and things are never as bad as it seems, right? So as I set this up right now, so I am currently, as soon as I, I close out the Alibaba position, this is probably the first position I'm putting on, right? And I'm going to specifically put on around a 0.1 absolute delta, and that is around $215, and collect $160, probably make it a spread, um, 215, 205, so make it a 10 point spread, um, collect, you know, about 70 or so dollars in premium. To be honest, I'm even thinking about making a bigger, a wider spread to collect even more at 200. I, that's something I'm starting to get more into. Um, the more and more I trade, the more and more I like wider spreads because you collect more money up front. And like I mentioned in my last video, I like to take profits quick. So I don't mind having chunkier positions because I know I'm going to take the profits as fast as possible, right? So perfectly fine with that happening with NVIDIA. And again, I will still be keeping my eyes on Walmart. Walmart is an interesting position that I'm really interested in, very interested in. And I am still waiting for the stock to bounce back. To me, it's a perfect story. The stock dips a little bit, um, lower end of trading range. Um, then it starts to recover. When it starts to recover, the likelihood of the stock falling once again, let alone falling through the floor um, of whatever put option I'm selling, whatever the strike price, very slim, right? Very slim. So, but I got to collect some premium along the way. And Walmart is seen as a relatively safe stock. So the only option I really have here is the 110. But the problem with the 110 is the um, probability is not there where I want it to be. I want the delta to be closer, absolute delta to be closer to 0.15. More like an 85% chance of me winning, 15% chance of me losing. For that to happen, Walmart needs to go up to 117, 118, that's all I need to do, just a few dollars going up. And once that happens, I am on it, right? I am definitely on it. That's what I'm, I'm aiming for. And touching right quick, um, one more time on why I prefer option selling over buying. Um, I'm going to just touch on it in just one chart, right? It's one chart. And if you are into, oh, that's not good. That's not, let's, uh, I, thought, all right, I thought I took this out. Okay. If you are into options in general, you have probably seen this chart before. This is how options values change over time as they get closer to expiration date they naturally decline, right? They naturally decrease, right? So if they're naturally decreasing, you're essentially making money like short sellers in the market make money, right? They sell a stock for $100. They, they borrow the stock, sell it for $100, hoping the stock goes down. If it goes down to $90, they buy it back and they keep the $10 difference, right? And they can even, they buy it back and instantly, um, instantly let go of the position. There's a lot of ways to do it. But essentially, that's the idea. Right, you sell now, you buy back later at a lower price, and you keep the difference. You know, similar to insurance in a lot of ways. That is the number one edge with selling options. The curve, it naturally comes down the closer it gets to expiration. Now, you could start doing it in this range. This range is, you know, some people do that, and that's perfectly fine. And to be honest, if you collect enough premium to do that, and if you're okay with this risk, then, then go for it. Be my guest. I am unsure. I am definitely unsure about that because um, that's where uh, things can turn on you very quickly. Um, even if it's a few days before expiration, um, just the risk, the amount of money you're receiving for the risk you're actually taking is not really worth it to me, right? So I come up a little bit more, come a little bit more, more in this 30 to 50 day range, right? 
that's where you collect a lot of premium, but you also starting to experience the decay. Number one reason to do this strategy. Number one reason to sell options in general. The, the numbers just naturally work in your favor, especially if you're choosing um, stocks or opportunities where you're already going into the trade, have 80, 85, 90% probability of winning, right? And this is, of course, this is accounting for this, but this happens faster than you think. And there's certain setups that makes it happen even faster, right? There's certain setups, like if you see in some of my earlier trades, you know, the days these trades were open, like they closed pretty quickly. Days held the stocks only, well, held the options, like trade only for a few days, right? If you can consistently do that, man, your, your, your account's going to take off, right? You're going to hit that 30 to 50 percent number, like how I hit 50 percent last year, right? Um, of course, I'll discuss more of that in my course. That's going to be coming up in a probably about a month or so from now. So be on the lookout. But, you know, that's way down the road. Now, let's do a little bit more and touch on the market news that matters. OK, so read this opinion on Market Watch. I think I've already mentioned before I'm a huge fan of Market Watch, um, not just the news, but the opinions on there, because I always found them to be pretty good. Um, found this opinion why, you know, what we can learn from what, 20 years ago, i.e. the tech bubble, which was a ridiculous time. Sometimes I, I get the comparison, but sometimes I'm like, look, this is not the late 90s where literally you could create any company, put dot com on it, go public and your stock will go through the roof. Like that's not happening, right? That is not happening this time around. But will I be honest and mention that, you know, things are a little heated? Yeah, relative to history. Now they have like this chart here that kind of compares like, hey, you know, if you look at valuations, you know, look at different measures, it's not as bad as, in some ways, not nearly as bad, like not even close as a tech bubble, but valuations are elevated higher than um, on average. You look at the long-term average of the stock market, right? And I get that, I definitely get that, but the, I also always make the argument that the dynamics are different. First off, you have just in general, the stock market, the companies, the public companies, they're just better companies. Hands down, they're better companies. They're more capital efficient, like capital intensity is not as high. They have higher profit margins. They generate more cash. Um, they're more dominant in their markets. So just like the world has become a world of haves and have nots, so has the markets, you know, so, so, so has many industries, right? So that's what's happening there. Um, so that's number one. And number two, um, the dynamics of actual market participants are different, right? So ever since the 80s, once um, bond yields, well, not, not even corporates, but government bond yields start slowly declining and institutional investors start looking for places to get, you know, actually have some decent returns, they turn to the stock market. They start turning to the stock market and lo and behold, a lot of money is getting pumped in. And speaking of money getting pumped into the stock market, this is another thing that's hidden under the covers that people don't really talk about. Um, it's the Federal Reserve and how essentially Ever since quantitative easing happened um, after the global financial crisis, 2008 carried over to 2009, the Federal Reserve has essentially been putting money into the, the financial markets. They've been throwing in billions and sometimes trillions of dollars into the market. Now, what does that mean? That means that there's a lot of support. There's just a lot of money flowing in. And in a way, it is pushing up, um, pushing up valuations, pushing up the stock market, just helping everything out. You put money into the money into the um, to a smaller market on the bond side that that depresses yields. And when yields depress, all that money needs to go somewhere to take risk. Right. So they're going to go to the stock market or it might go to private equity or it might go to venture capital or it might go into more distressed debt. You know, go all these other places where they're trying to get yield. Right. So this woman um, in particular, um, Danielle D. Martino Booth, um, she mentioned like, hey, look. They're not saying it, but this is essentially another way to do quantitative easing. Another way to just throw money at the stock market. And now this is why numbers are unreasonable. Valuations are unreasonable. Now, I don't believe that. I believe everything is justified, like I mentioned before. But it is something to keep in mind, right? The Federal Reserve is a hidden. It is a hidden player in everything here. It definitely is. So you need to watch out for that. So once the and it played out, right? So it played out in 2018. In 2018, before the stock market fell 20%, right, from October to December, um, Christmas Eve, 
months beforehand, the Federal Reserve start raising interest rates, right? They start raising interest rates. And then, of course, months afterwards, you see all what happened, right? And as soon as the Federal Reserve said, all right, we're going to stop cutting, we're going to stop raising interest rates, we're going to think about cutting rates, the market quickly turned around, right, at the beginning of 2019. So that is the dynamic we're, we're looking at here. You have to pay close attention to that, right? Got to pay close attention to that because that is the dynamics being driven here. As soon as you start reading that the Federal Reserve is starting to increase interest rates once again or they're stopping what they're doing now stop adding money to their balance sheet be wary because the market is kind of living off of that right now i'll admit that much the market is living a little bit off that um, but at the same time i still feel like valuations are justified once they get to non-justifiable levels you should get in cash or you know just getting the trading options you know just selling options you can still make money in a in a bear market I think I've talked about that before. It's um, what Warren, Warren Buffett did in particular. So you can be like him and just sell, just learn how to sell um, options in a naked, well, in a bear market. If you want to learn more about some of what he was doing um, and his three secrets, I got three secrets that the media just does not talk about. Make sure to download my free PDF guide discussing those three secrets and how can how you can use those three secrets to take your investment game to the next level. Create a six, seven figure account in no time. Like, I'm not saying it's a breeze, but you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'll say that. So, let's go ahead and get into this YouTube shout out. All right, and we will be shouting out the guy's name is, if his name pops up, um, I know it's Daniel something. All right, all right. His name is, come on now. All right, sorry for the, uh, Little technical difficulties there. <laughs> His name is Daniel Prunk. Um, really interesting YouTuber. And to be honest, he focuses really on one stock. He focuses on Aurora, right? That is the cannabis stock. That's one of the top two cannabis stocks. Um, the other one being Canopy Growth. Um, that is mainly what he, he talks about. He has a full like PDL um, discussing... Uh, what is it? Uh, I think he has it in here, but literally has a free PDF in one of his videos, like his full like thesis on Aurora, right? It's a 15 pager. Uh, he's discussing the ups and downs. This is actually a trend that's happening in YouTube. Now with finance YouTubers, they are just literally focusing on one stock, right? One stock, one name, probably the most interesting one, of course. Like I've seen this happen with Tesla for a couple of finance YouTubers. And I'll touch on them a little bit more, but yeah. That's all they're doing. All they're they're all they're doing is just focusing on one company and giving it their all, right? So here's some of his other videos. Um, definitely check him out. I think his his information is pretty good. Definitely goes more in depth, and I, I'm starting to get a trend that that's probably where to go. That's probably why he he has you know has done so much. So as you can just see through his channel, it's a lot of Aurora, um, especially um, maybe not his older ones but you look newer it's like it's almost all he talks about so it is what it is so check him out definitely check him out got to support other finance youtubers we are all out here grinding we're all out here trying to make stuff happen now let's get into our real life lesson for today which is why i believe kevin hart is rich but not wealthy so I just finished binge watching Kevin Hart's latest docu-series on Netflix I'm called Don't F This Up. Um, really when he's discussing his life journey, um, including his background, um, you can see his lifestyle, and he discusses his flaws on the mistakes he's made as a, as a man. So that's very good, very good, very interesting um, like look into his life. Now don't get it twisted, Kevin Hart barely cracks my top five of comedians, like barely. Like for me, Chris Rock, hands down, it's not even close. Let's no, no, no debating, no arguing. He's number one to me. All right, maybe it's my generation. Dave Chappelle's number two. I grew up watching the Chappelle Show when I shouldn't been. If my parents knew, they would be kind of mad right now. It is what it is. Then of course, you know, Sinbad to me is underrated. You know, I'll put him at three. It, I'll put Eddie Murphy. Delirious was really good. And then it's Kevin Hart. Well, you can make a case for Richard Pryor over him. And you can make a case, Richard. Well, if no Richard Pryor, there's no Kevin Hart. So, as you can hear, I only, he barely is making my top five, maybe top six. But I will give him credit. I will give him the credit that he has the drive 
the business savvy and the vision that no other comedians ever had. He's taking it to another level um, and not consistently with the content, right? So first it's him building his own production company, Heartbeat Productions, right? That is some, it's more than just, I have a team and they look out for me. No, he's setting them up um, with credits across different films, different things that they're doing. And that is, that is next level, right? That's, that's making things official and trying to actually build something beyond yourself, right? And um, also, one thing that's really interesting about him is all the movies he's in, right? He's like consistently on the grind. He's consistently moving. Watching that docuseries, you can really tell like he is not comfortable staying in one spot. Like he has to be moving towards something. He needs a goal to move towards. And I get that, I understand that. Even when I was watching it, I was like, man, I think I work hard, but I can work harder. I mean, I can really work harder. If he can do that, I should be able to do more. So it is kind of inspiring to see that, you know, from somebody who's made, who quote unquote, has so much success, keep pushing that hard, keep working that hard. Like that's definitely like an inspirational story to me. But of course you notice some other things in there. Um, you notice the lifestyle, the house, the cars, the, the private jets. Uh, which are signs of wealth, but Kevin Hart also mentioned something that made me think otherwise, right? And I mean, part of that drive is, you know, his background, um, that natural, natural passion for comedy. And he saw how hard his mom worked, right? He saw how hard his mom worked. He was like, I can work hard. I can make this happen. She saw the, he saw the sacrifices she made for him. And he f is forever grateful. That's a good drive. And he's also doing something in like something he's really passionate about, he feels like it's his purpose in life. That's great. That's those are good things to be driven by. But um, he has this fear that he can lose it all tomorrow, right? He has this fear that it can all go away tomorrow. All the money, all the cars, and the fame can go away tomorrow. And it almost happened, by the way. That almost happened. I mean, if if the LBGTQ thing actually really, really blew up, it could have ruined everything. Um, but it didn't. But when I also hear that statement, I think of other thoughts, like how much money does he have in the bank? Does he, does he own dividend stocks? Does he, does he have any rental properties? Um, how much money does he personally get from YouTube? Uh, how much is the heartbeat production business built not on his image, right? All these things that are like be more passive income streams that will leave you to not worry about money because it's clear Kevin Hart is not just worried about building up like a legacy he's worried about money he's worried about a lifestyle right so maybe that's part of it but it's also like if you set up your life if you set up certain things certain investments where well, the money will just come to you with maybe little time or even no time at all dedicated to it that shouldn't be a concern it shouldn't be a concern at all you shouldn't be thinking those type of things but if you never set that up then it's not going to happen and you know, I just gave him credit for Heartbeat Productions, but at the same time, he can never sell Heartbeat Productions. Why? Because it's based off his image. And a company's only worth how much you can sell it for, right? And he, he can't walk away from it. He can't walk away from it. It's built too much on his image, right? So maybe he's making moves towards that. Maybe he does have, you know, a dividend portfolio or rental income coming in, you know, where maybe I'm misreading that he's worried about that but from what i can see like no that's a big driver like he wants to be a billionaire because of the status but he also wants to be a billionaire because he probably thinks at that number he doesn't have to worry about about money anymore but it will always be there if you don't set things up that concern will always be there that you do not have enough so for yourself the lesson out of this is start setting those things up start making investments in things that can pay you let your money work for you, right? It's the whole, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad thing, right? So, I mean, it's great advice. It's a great starting point, right? So if you build up a business, try to build up a business with systems in place where you don't have to be there, you know, or invest in dividend stocks and give this option trading a try. Don't give me, I'm ready to teach you some things. You know, I got a course coming up pretty soon. So be on the lookout for that. Or hell, go with, go with real estate. That's, that's the common way. A lot of people go to real estate way, get some rental properties in. It's a safe way to make money. Um, safer, I'll say that, safer. But 
just start setting these things up so that you do not feel like you have to work constantly every day every year to actually generate an income to support your lifestyle so yeah that's the lesson for today if there's any other comedians you all think that are better than kevin hart and maybe want me to touch on let me know in the comment sections um, so just a quick recap on everything going forward uh, we are going to discuss more of the options portfolio in episode three as well as we're going to discuss my dallas cowboy fandom super bowl is right around the corner and the more and more i think about the, the cowboys the more and more i get the blues so stay tuned for that all right that's it for the show thanks for watching and stay sophisticated